Let's talk a little bit about what I'll call the Plutsky plan, because it came from my friend Todd Plutsky. But I think it's a good plan. But let's think about a little bit of its repercussions and see if it's more or less likely to actually work. Well, first of all, and you know, I threw out in the last video 50 banks. Maybe that's logistically difficult. You, instead of having 50 banks with 14 billion of initial capital, maybe you do uh, five banks with 140 billion dollars of initial capital. But the point being is that you should have more than one bank. It shouldn't be too big to fail, and and you should try to instill some type of competition there. But because they have pristine balance sheets, all of these banks are going to be able to lever 10 to 1, which we know isn't crazy. Merrill Lynch and, and Morgan Stanley and all the likes have been leveraging up 30 and 40 to 1. So 10 to 1 is normal for a bank. And frankly, they're probably going to be able to attract a lot more. You know, We said uh, you know, foreign governments probably willing to lend to them. The private sector is willing to lend to them. A lot of, if these are commercial banks, which means that they can take deposits, a lot of people are going to be willing to essentially put their money with this bank because it has a clean balance sheet and it is essentially owned it'll be owned individually by the american people and it will have this federal backstop above and beyond the the fdic insurance limits and all of that although i do like the the one provision to increase the fdic uh, caps and maybe i'll do a uh, the insurance caps on on deposits but it'll actually be able to attract a lot of deposits from everyday people they'll feel safer with these these banks so in, in terms of whether uh, you'll be able to capitalize these banks and lever up 10 to 1 i don't think there's an issue there then there, there's the question, will it solve the fundamental problem of, of keeping credit markets flowing to those people that it needs to keep credit to? Well, we already said that it'll have no trouble uh, being able to have access to funds above and beyond how much the government capitalizes it with. It'll be able to attract deposits. It'll be able to attract uh, investment from, from the private sector and from, from international money, especially with this five-year government backstop. So it will be able to essentially put 10 times as money back into the system. So if you take $700 billion collectively, You'll be able to. This will introduce seven, uh, ten times as much. So, so seven trillion dollars of new loans. Seven trillion of new loans. So, if there's seven trillion of, I mean, that's literally half of of the American GDP. I mean, you might argue that is too much. That might that might provide too much credit, and it might go from you know thawing to overheating credit markets. So then you might say, well, if seven trillion is too much liquidity, well, why don't we just reduce this number a little bit? Why instead of saying seven hundred billion, why don't you make it a hundred billion, right? Because then a hundred billion, if you do ten banks with ten billion each, so you you introduce a hundred. Let me just say a hundred billion. They all lever up because it's all new. It's new liabilities and new assets, clean balance sheets. It'll introduce $1 trillion of new loans that it can go put to work for people building factories and doing real things. And because their incentive is not to bail out their friends, um, it's not to help out the companies they used to work for, the companies that are donating um, to them in some way or contributing to them or promising jobs in some way, it won't go, this trillion dollars, is not going to go to buy assets at higher prices than they should. You know, it could go to buy assets at discount prices if the new managers of these banks do see a good return, but most probably they'll invest it in, in areas of the economy where they do see a positive return on, on investment. And 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 I, I one person had had sent me a note said, hey, wouldn't introducing all of this um, liquidity into the into the financial system, whether it's seven trillion or one trillion, wouldn't that lead to hyperinflation? And I'll probably do a whole series on inflation. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around it. In general, if anyone makes a positive investment, so if if I have a dollar and I make an, a, an investment where it generates a dollar twenty of benefit, that by definition, that by definition is not inflationary because I had a dollar in the world. I had a dollar in the world, and I created a dollar twenty of wealth. So actually, the pie gets bigger. A, a good way to think about inflation. I'll do a lot about this because it is kind of it is a very abstract concept. Let's say that this is the pie of goods and services in the world, or let's say just say in a country, right? Goods and services, goods and services in a year. You could say it's our GDP, or however you want to measure it. Goods and services in a year, in a year. Right? That's the goods and services in a year. And let's say I have another pool of the amount of money there is in, in a given year. So money. 
And the money supply is an interesting thing, because it's not just dependent on the amount of physical coins or dollars. It also is a function of how quickly those transact and how much leverage there is in the system. So you can actually have a whole economy where everyone just has $1 bill, but every time someone needs something from someone else, they exchange that $1 bill. So that $1 bill gets used you know, 15 trillion times a year. So you'd actually have $15 trillion of, of, of money, because the velocity would be so high. But anyway, let's just say that this is the pool of money. If this pool, the pool of money, grows faster than the actual goods and services and the actual productive capacity of that country, then you have inflation. So if this circle is, grows faster than this one, you have inflation. If this circle grows faster than this circle, you have deflation. You have the same, or you have some amount of money representing more goods and services. So goods and services actually become cheaper. And the the, the problem that we're talking about right now, this credit crisis. This is a problem of deleveraging, where the government injects a dollar into the, this current broken banking system. And instead of that dollar, you know, you, you le- nor- the normal system is you lend a dollar to a bank. So you lend one dollar to a bank. And then, let's say this is the Fed. Right? This is how they inject liquidity. They lend a dollar to a bank. Let me draw a bank here. Then that bank has to keep, it can only lever 10 to 1. So it essentially, it, it has to keep in reserve 10 cents of that dollar, but then it lends 90 cents to somebody else, to another bank. Right? Then that other bank has to keep 10% of that, so it lends 81 cents to someone else. And then that someone else can lend whatever 81 times 0.9 is. So I don't know, 70 something cents to someone else. But you, you get the idea that in a normal functioning, in a normal functioning uh, uh, banking system, one dollar injected into the system has this multiplier effect. So it actually creates a lot of money, and that's what people are implicitly talking about when they talk about the printing press. But what's going on right now is the Fed lends one dollar to Bank A, but Bank A is so scared, is so scared that it doesn't lend out to anyone else. It just keeps that dollar because right now their main priority isn't to try to get a little bit of incremental interest on whatever money they have, their main priority is survival. So that dollar just goes into a black hole. And so that's what the, the Fed's frustration is. It keeps lending money into the system, but that money keeps disappearing. And actually, the, as the economy slows, the velocity of money is going to slow down as well. So the main problem when you have a credit crisis and when you have a recession is actually the money supply shrinks. The amount of goods and services probably shrinks as well, but the money supply shrinks even more. So your main problem is deflation. And that's why, uh, you know, that was the main problem in in the Great Depression, and that was the main problem in the Japanese crisis. And you know, Ben Bernanke, he's written papers about this, and he's like, well, you can always you can always cure deflation by printing money and dropping money from a helicopter. Well. To some degree, that's what they've already been trying to do. They've already been the Fed's been willing to take you know re, take pretty large credit risks on bank and lending money into the system. But the problem is, is if this multiplier effect is disappearing at a faster rate than you are dropping money from a helicopter, you still have deflation, right? Before, when you not only levered le, let people lever ten to one, you let them lever. 30 to 1 and 40 to 1, every dollar you put into the system became $40 that it was given to someone else, and then they could lever up. So you had this huge explosion of money. And frankly, the only reason why we didn't have inflation, I mean, in the last 5, 10 years, we had this huge explosion of money. And the only reason why it didn't, it, it didn't, at least in measurable inflation, show up is that because on the other side of the equation, you had all of this new productive capacity come online in China and India. And so manufactured goods got a lot cheaper. But in things that were not manufactured goods, like commodities, like homes, you had this huge asset inflation. Or even college tuition or health care, things that are dependent on, on American labor. It became hugely expensive, and that's because you had this huge, huge um, infusion of you know. There's there's different ways to measure money, but the broadest indicator, which is called M3, and I know I'm kind of going out of the domain, but I'll make a bunch of videos on this. The broadest indicator, M3, which the government stopped officially reporting, exploded because there was so much leverage in the system. Now things are the, the exact opposite is happening. The leverage is disappearing from the system. There's no lending to each other. Everyone is going from 30, 1 to 30 leverage to 1 to 10 leverage. So money is actually disappearing in the system. The velocity is slowing. This is shrinking. 
but this is shrinking more no matter what the Fed is doing. And frankly, this new $700, $700 billion bailout, I personally think this is the helicopter that Ben Bernanke always talked about using. And whenever you're going to drop money from a helicopter, the question is, where do you drop it? And they think they should drop it into a, an already broken banking system. The point of this video and the last is, maybe you should just drop it into a new banking system. Or maybe you just drop it into everyone's pockets and, and, and see what happens, and you let new banks form where, where they can. Anyway, that's all for this video. I know it was a little bit rambling, but hopefully you learned a little bit. See you in the next video.